Welcome to Pro EDU Interviews, everybody. Today, we're going to be talking to a couple of amazing photographers about something that's really important, often overlooked, and unfortunately rife with bad advice, and that is how to price your photography. How do you do it? How do you choose what kind of price range you want to be in for the work that you do, for the market that you're in, for the experience that you have. There's just so much there and it can be really, really hard to navigate that space. So today I've got with me two amazing photographers, Kevin Kleiches and also the lovely Chris Knight. And we're going to be talking about pricing from the ground up so that you feel comfortable building your price structure all the way from your salary to how you get you self-established in your market, the cost of doing business, all that good stuff. So welcome guys. Thank you so much for being here. Good to be here. All right. So really quickly, I'm gonna have you introduce yourselves real fast just so that everybody knows who you are. And then we will get into the meat of this interview. Kevin, why don't you start? Sure. Uh, my name is Kevin Kleitches. I am a photographer based in Wilmington, North Carolina. Um, I've been doing it since 2017, full time. And I, I focus on um, portraiture, specifically editorial portraits and commercial photography. So I'm happy to be here. Right on. Chris, please go ahead. And I'm Chris Knight. I'm a portrait and photographer based in New York. And I'm also happy to be here talking about something that was a little bit of a mystery to me for the first probably two thirds of my career. So happy to happy to talk about strategy and pricing structure. I love that you admit that because I feel like um, that's why we get into trouble is because this is something nobody really wants to talk honestly about um, and admit the fact that sometimes we make a lot of mistakes trying to figure this process out. And I know for a lot of commercial photographers, it continues to be a struggle because when you're putting in those bids, like who are you competing against and what do they want? And what did that person, you know, what's their, maybe they can afford to charge less than I can. I mean, it, it can become a, a big ball of mess. So first let's just dispense with the bad advice of charge what you're worth. Um, that is, seems to be the biggest piece of advice photographers want to sling at each other. And yet it's also kind of the most unhelpful. So Kevin, when you hear the words charge what you're worth, what does that make you think of and how do you approach that? You know, it actually makes me think of the stuff I used to say all the time to photographers and I probably still do just because I do feel like there's a lot of merit to it. Um, simply because I feel like uh, a lot of photographers and artists in general tend to under charge and sort of uh, discount themselves and their time and talent. So while I do think it's good advice in general, the problem is that it does leave a lot of, you know, you have a lot of questions when you're being told to charge what you're worth, like where do you even start? And I, I would say to really kind of uh, address that, the best thing you can do is really consider all of the factors involved uh, in your pricing. Where you, where you live, your market, um, your experience level, and um, what you're able to bring to the table, anything unique that you can bring to the table, that all factors into your pricing. Um, otherwise, you know, it, like I said, it's, it's good general advice, but you really have to kind of delve deeper and do your research as a photographer so that you are finding that comfortable middle ground um, and make where the client's happy and then you're also happy with what you're charging. Uh, Nicole, I think we, I think you're muted. muted. So lovely. There you go. I think what frustrates me about um, that advice is that it's just not actionable. And, and when somebody says that, okay, but what does that mean? Like, what do I do from there? And I'm really glad that that's actually what we get to address today. So um, Chris, from your perspective, that idea of charge what you're worth, like, what does that mean for you? Yeah, I mean, it, it definitely means well. Uh, it just, it doesn't quite become something that can be articulated um, evenly to everybody because it's, 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 Great advice to say, hey, you know, you should you should know, um, you know, what you're worth. And I, I think there are definitely instances where I want to instill that to I mean, people to not uh, cut themselves. And I think it's more about establishing value for yourself. And not everyone is always 100 percent of aware of what value means um, when they're when they're starting out. And. Um, if you come out and you say, hey, listen, I'm going to do I'm going to do a portrait session for 50 bucks. That's what I think people are trying to dissuade younger people from, because it does uh, kind of devalue uh, 
a lot of what this job entails. And so we have to kind of figure out uh, what best suits our business model for where we live, you know, as Kevin was saying, um, and, and what our experience level is. And we have to do this very kind of complicated algorithm to figure out um, where that value number comes into play and, and how that kind of translates to what we can charge for our work. Yeah, great point. And I think the thing that um, is going to be so great about this conversation is we'll be able to start from the bottom, from what you need to charge, what market you're in, what business type you want to have, what the cost of doing business is, and take that kind of broad charge what you're worth advice and actually break it down into something that's actionable. So what I wanted to do is actually start with this idea of salary, because I think photographers think in terms, at least photographers who are trying to run this as a business, think in terms of their business as a whole and don't always separate the fact that your business gets paid and then you get paid. And those are two distinct things. And so for me, at least, I know the first part of figuring out what I should charge for my work is how much I need to get paid. So what does that look like, Kevin, from a portrait and commercial photographer's perspective? How do you figure out what your salary needs to be? Yeah, I, I really think I'm glad you're starting with salary because I can say that from I've talked to so many photographers in the past and uh, you wouldn't believe how so many of them just kind of assume a number or they just kind of make up a number to start with. And they don't quite know that you you need to actually be approaching it from what are your monthly expenses? You know, what what is the, uh, the salary that you want to get paid? Um, for me personally, I was kind of using my career before photography as the basis of what I wanted to charge or what I wanted to pay myself as a salary. So, so um, I was working in mental health before I got into photography and I think I was making around like 30 to 40. And um, as, I, as I've grown as a person and my expenses have also grown, um, I feel like I, I have a good idea and understanding of what I should be, uh, what, what I want to make every year on top of the profit that I wanna make for my photography business. And so um, really it's just kind of where you are in your stage of life and the standard of living that you want for yourself. Because um, I, I think that, you know, it's not enough to just survive as a photographer. If you want to be in business, you want to be profiting. And a lot of people don't embrace that. They're almost afraid to say, well, I don't want to charge like too much because then I'll be living a good life and that will be against the law. It's like, no, actually you're in business so you can do what you love and have a life that you love. And so you need to be more, you need to be doing more than just the bare minimum and surviving and scraping by. You need to be paying yourself a salary that's going to give you a good life. And that's where, that's the advice that I want everyone who's watching or listening to understand is that um, the salary should be providing you enough to live a good life. So kind of thrive, not survive mentality, right? That's right. Yeah, for sure. So Chris, what about you when you're looking at salary um, and, and building that? What does that look like? Yeah, I mean, I'm going to I'm going to parrot all of that. I mean, it's that's all excellent advice. You have to figure out what your expenses are. And, and uh, obviously, you don't want to take in most of the profit of the business. You kind of have to have a bit of a rainy day fund and figure out what that number happens to be, obviously, based on uh, how well business is doing um, you know, when taxes and all that kind of stuff needs to make sense uh, when you kind of look at it later on down the road. Um, these are all kind of factors we have to to kind of consider and, and, and take in. I mean, don't expect necessarily to make $50,000 a year starting out your first year. Uh, when I when I first started years ago, um, I, you know, there were definitely years where I was making sub twenty thousand dollars a year doing this and it wasn't for several years uh that i kind of was able to kind of get get enough of a groove going uh to where that money kind of didn't didn't always feel like i was just barely making enough to pay my bills and and, and rent uh and so you know it's it's sometimes a very difficult challenging process but you know the hope is that you stick with it long enough and it eventually kind of works itself out but, you know, uh, not everyone needs to kind of come at this from a full-time salary perspective. Uh, there's something to be said for the part-time salary perspective as well. Uh, and if you have the, you know, have a main source of income, you do photography as a, as a supplemental thing, uh, it's a 
it's an excellent place to be because a lot of times it gives you the opportunity to say what are jobs you don't want to do. And, you know, I think there's, there's a lot of people who work in the photographic industry today who aren't necessarily doing this full time. They are doing it part time. And I think it's, it's, it's a bigger makeup now than it ever was. That definitely seems to be the case for sure. Um, so do you think you mentioned that, you know, obviously your salary is kind of a percentage of what your business earns. Do you think, is there a standard percentage you think that you should be taking from your business? 10%, 20%, where do you think that should live? Um, there, I, I did not go to business school and there probably is a percent, <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, so, so to kind of speak to that whole, pull the number out of the ether, uh, that's, that's me. Uh, but I do it, I do it much more on the conservative end. Um, you know, I, I probably, yeah, I'm, I'm probably in the 20% range, right. 15, 20% range. Yeah. I would argue that anything of, above zero is, is you're doing okay. You know, like yeah. if you're paying yeah. yourself something, then you're doing all right. The challenge yeah, is, you sure. know, it's, it's definitely been a flow and, you know, uh, I, I definitely was, was much higher than 20% this past year. Um, yeah. so, you know, I think, I think it's a, it's a much harder thing to kind of figure out if we're basing it off that number and then going forward, how long is it even going to take for those numbers to get back to where they were, uh, in 2019? Yeah, that's a really good point and um, kind of brings up this idea of figuring out your salary from the perspective of not just taking a wild guess, right? Like you guys said, looking at what your income needs to be in order to survive. What is your mortgage? What is your insurance? What does it cost to keep up your car, to put your kids in school, to keep food on your table? And then those other important things that we sometimes throw by the wayside, like our savings, our vacation time, all of that, that stuff. If we want to be thriving in this industry, then we need to give ourselves a salary that's going to allow us to do that. And of course, that's going to be highly dependent upon some other things that we'll talk about a little bit later, like where you sit in the market and how long it might take you to build yourself back up. Chris said, um, you know, starting maybe only making 20,000 a year um, it takes a little while to, to build yourself up, particularly depending on your market and what your um, experience is like. So I think that the main takeaway, it seems like from salary is to base those numbers on hard facts, on actual things that you need and not some kind of nebulous idea of your worth, because that is tied to 8 million different factors. But if you look at your expense statements from the last year, if you look at your bank account, if you look at your withdrawals, you'll have a pretty good idea what you need to earn in order to survive. I also want to throw one more point in is that, you know, my whole life growing up, you know, they tell you that your, uh, your rent or your housing expenses shouldn't be more than, what was it? 20%. I think, I think it was something like that growing up. Oh, you shouldn't pay more than 20. Like I, I have like for most of my life, like that wasn't even close to an option to be able to pay that low of a number. So you just couldn't get those places. And if you live in a big city, you're definitely not like those, those traditional metrics don't exist anymore. And I, I don't 100% know what, what that should be, you know, but you also, you, you have to kind of take some kind of conservatism into into perspective when it comes to um, what you spend your money on. I mean, I, when I was 22, 25, I mean, rent took up 90% of the money that I made. So what should that look like? Um, and I wasn't living beyond my means. It was just the cheapest thing that could, I could find. Uh, so what does that look like in today's world? How much should you be spending on X, Y, Z? Like those are like, what are your big expenses and can you find ways to you know, trim those back and stuff. Yeah, definitely. So the main thing, folks, is to to really look at that from a holistic perspective, to look at what your salary needs to be in real numbers for where you live and what you need to survive on. Um, and if you can't earn that, and that's your minimum, then maybe you need to start out as a hobbyist. I mean, that's something that I think we have to consider. It might be great to dive into something full time, but if you're not going to be able to pay for health insurance, that's a pretty big deal, guys. So really look at that hard. And sometimes salto mortale, sometimes that leap into the void does pay off, but it is a risk you have to be willing to take and you have to account for that. So when we talk about pricing, I think the first thing we want to look at is salary, look at real numbers, 
build that from a place of understanding what you actually have to earn in order to get by. And then the second thing, guys, that I wanted to talk about is actually business type. So a lot of times what we're able to build and how we structure our pricing is actually going to be determined by the type of business that we're running. Um, as a sole proprietor, I might be able to get away with a lot less expenses than an LLC might need to have, particularly if I'm employing other people as well. So um, for both of you, you know, how, what are, do you think some, might be some good advice for people when they're looking at initially how they're going to structure their business? Um, and I know like, I don't think any of us like have MFAs or MBAs or anything. So like we, we can't come in and be like, yeah, well, according to all of my vast knowledge on every type of business, but um, from your experience, you know, looking at business type, um, maybe uh, there's a mom in, you know, Washington state who is a sole proprietor and she's working in the evenings and maybe there's somebody in Tulsa who is running an LLC and they're doing, you know, commercial stuff out of a small studio. So when we start looking at um, what we need to charge, how does business type play into that? Um, well, I'll start again, just because it's been, it's left to right on my screen. So it's just really yeah. convenient for me. To <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't have an MBA. Um, I did go to school for business though. Um, and so I, I will say that a big advantage of being an LLC is that you're a legal structure. So that's, there's this, there's this kind of like officiality to your business that I think psychologically really helps like you're legit. But in addition to that, uh, you, you do have some protection. And, and of course, no one wants to worry about um, lawsuits and litigation and things like that. But a, a major benefit to being an LLC is the fact that you are a separate, your business is a separate entity from, from you as an individual. So um, you know, provided that you are in a situation where a client wants to come after you for whatever reason, um, they can only go after your business assets and not like your house. So that's a pretty major uh, benefit. Um, and I will, I will say that it, it's going to differ in every state uh, or even country. Uh, but if you're an LLC um, it, in North Carolina, at least it's, it's not this, you're not paying a, a ton of uh, uh, expenses or fees to be an LLC. Um, generally, you're you're filing what's called an Articles of Incorporate or of Organization rather, and you have a privilege license and maybe a couple of other things. But it's it's nothing like you're not paying like you know ten thousand dollars a year in fees. Um, so I think you know uh, most photographers would do well to consider an LLC as soon as they're able to. Um, because I do think that the benefits outweigh the very, the very small costs involved. So when you talk about costs involved, what do people need to keep in mind then, um, for an LLC, what, what do they, or what are they looking at pricing structure wise? Um, like the, the cost or like the exact cost for, well, not the exact file cost, LLC? so, so let's say if, um, I can start a sole proprietorship tomorrow, right? Um, uh -huh. I can, and I, I can have maybe no, almost no associated costs. Maybe I open up a second prep bank account if I want to, but I can, I can actually keep my, my own bank account, um, as a sole proprietor. I don't even technically need a business account depending on the state. Sure. So what are some of the things pricing wise that people need to keep in mind for setting up an LLC? Yeah. Well, I can say that the articles of organization, for example, is like $125 to file your business with the secretary of state. Um, a privilege license in North Carolina is $50 and that's good for one year. So you renew that once a year. Um, and I think that I've looked into other states as well and the cost is pretty similar. Um, every LLC and above has to, when I say above, I mean like anything of like a, a, a corporation, a partnership, you have to file a annual report. And I think an annual report is about $200 um, every, every year, you know, and so in addition to that, you, I think you might have to, depending on your state, you have to pay uh, monthly sales tax or quarterly sales tax on your goods or services. So I think a lot of people are like, well, you don't have to pay taxes because it's digital and that's no longer the case. I don't, I don't even know if that was ever the case. Um, you, you pay monthly or you pay sales tax, uh, because your digital images are still considered uh, a product or a good at least in North Carolina. So again, I keep mentioning my state because of course it's gonna differ slightly from state to state. Um, but the bottom line is it's gonna be probably a few hundred dollars at most to, um, to have to incorporate or to become an LLC. Okay, right on. And then 
um, people obviously make sure that you look into your state because there's going to be some differences there and there, there will be code for that. So Chris, um, do you have any thoughts on like business type and how that kind of plays into what people need to look at when they're strategizing for pricing? Yeah. I mean, I, I also have an LLC and in New York, it's very similar. Uh, there are a couple of other things we have to do. Like, um, like this is a little bit more expensive. We have some stupid archaic thing where we have to like advertise in a newspaper, uh, for some <laughs> there is like two newspapers you have to advertise in. There's like an establishment of the LLC where you have to pay to advertise like a classified section. Uh, that sounds like weird. strong arming. Like somebody has a relationship, yeah. right? Like and, and like it was like it was like in the Albany Current or something, something stupid like that. But but oh it's a gosh. thing we have to do. Um, it ended up probably taking I don't know a month or so. By the time it was maybe a little bit longer. By the time it was all said and done. But it was it was in that price bracket. Uh, I find the LLC is valuable for the same sort of reasons, the, the protections. But also, there there are multiple companies that I deal with that require you to be an LLC uh, for them to pay you, um, and so it's just it's, it's an easier thing to have to deal with. Uh, there are there's there's a couple of challenges with it, um, depending upon where you live, which state you live. So. There are many states, for example, that allow you to transfer your LLC to another state without any issue. Uh, New York is not one of those states. So, for example, if I move from New York to New Jersey and wanted to uh, change the location of my business to pay taxes in New Jersey instead of New York, I would actually have to dissolve my New York LLC and then reestablish a new one in the next state. And so it's just it's a whole mess. Uh, of that, which which some states are very friendly to transfer, and then some do not let you. And New York is one that does not let you. So it makes sense for people to keep that in mind, particularly. Um, and uh, you know, if you're moving often, then you you know want to know what those laws are for. You you may have some carryover or other things that have to. Happen. And and even moving from New York, New Jersey is not an unusual thing. Like it, it happened. Right. Uh, you know, into the tri-state area. I've, I've, you know, several several friends who've done it, and you know, I, I, you know, you keep you keep your business, or you totally dissolve it and reestablish a new one, which is just, you know, its own setup. Right, and actually, that it brings up something important that um, when we're talking about pricing, when you have to do something like that, it's not just cost that involved, but it's your time. And when you have to take that time out to reestablish yourself, somebody somewhere else, that actually is going to cost you money because it's costing you time. So I think that's an important thing for people to keep in mind as well. So um, and then not only business type as far as you know an LLC or sole proprietor, but also we're looking at things like retail versus commercial photography and how those differences play into the kind of pricing that we build for ourselves. Um, and a you know maybe a small town portrait photographer who's working out of their garage, they might be making a thousand dollars per session. And a you know commercial photographer who's shooting for Nike, they might be making thirty, forty, fifty, sixty thousand um, dollars for a huge campaign. So um, when we're looking at how we how we build our business, um, I think you know business type and who your who your client is also plays a factor. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. I mean, uh, in either case, though, whether you're doing a retail or commercial, I think that um, photographers, like I mentioned earlier, just if you're serious, if you're if you're going to be doing it full time, especially, but even if you're doing it part time, um, having that legal structure in place is going to help you. And I feel like especially if you're doing commercial photography, um, I think that there's a really just a big advantage there. And like Chris was saying earlier, some clients may even require that you are a legal business structure, that you are an LLC or a corporation in order to pay you. And so if that's the case, then it obviously is that's going to be a deal breaker and for you to for you to, to need to do that. If you're doing retail photography, and, and for those who, who aren't familiar, if retail is simply direct to consumer, the images are being are personal use only, they're not being sold or, or used as advertising or marketing. Um, if you are doing a retail and a lot of your stuff, a lot of your clients are retail clients, then it might not be, you know, obviously they're not going to care if you're an LLC or not. They just want nice pictures, right? If, they, if the pictures look good, you're good to go. But um, when it comes to uh, clients and uh, bigger projects, they're, they're going to look for more of the uh, official uh, legal structures and stuff like that. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I see you nodding over there, Chris. Did you have a thought? 
Oh, I think you're mu muted, Chris, yep. or I can't yeah. hear you. It's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's just it's 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 something to remember that you know is is we we all get into this for taking pictures and stuff, but but to run a photography business, I mean, ten percent of of my time, if that is is taking pictures, it's 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 everything else, and um, like you have to kind of protect yourself and fit within the structure of of how businesses run their business, and you know that's that. It's a big part of it. Yeah, it's important stuff, people. So do your research there. See what kind of business type is going to really fit your life. Um, and, and I think we do have to probably dispense with something really quick before we move on to market research. I think a lot of people have in their head that if you want to be making the big money in photography, you need to be a commercial photographer, right? Like if you want to be making the big bucks. Um, and like, that's, that's the thing. I know several portrait photographers who are making six figures a year very comfortably out of their homes. Um, and so that's not to say that that it's not the possibility to move beyond that. But um, I think we we make the assumption that because commercial commercial photographers are making all the money, which means us portrait photographers must settle for we can only make this, right? We get this idea that I can't make a million dollars out of my home studio. Um, and, and there are photographers proving that wrong all over the place. So that has got to come down to how you build your pricing, right? And who you're, who you're marketing to and who your clients are. And if you're shooting basketball players' wives, um, you know what I mean? Then, then you're probably going to be, you're probably going to be doing all right. Um, if you're looking at, you know, you want to be affordable for the, the local moms in your area or the the maybe you're working with um you know young boxers or whatever like you know you have to consider that your market is going to help determine how much you can earn from them so let's move into talking market research and what does that look like when you're trying to decide are you going to build your business around the work that you want to make or the money that you want to make, can you do both? Um, and when you're doing market research, how does that play into how you figure that out? Because so I'm here in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, it is a kind of mid-sized city, the biggest city in New Mexico. Um, but it's the hugely differing in you know the income. So very, very low income to medium high income. And then of course, as you get into Santa Fe and Taos and other places, you know, you've got you've got people who are living in multi-million dollar homes and skiing all the time. So it's it's a wide distribution. And if what I really love is fantasy photography, do I have the market here that's gonna allow me to earn the living I need to make in order to take care of myself and my family? So when you guys are looking at market research, how do you approach that? Um, and let me grab Chris first this time. Well, I mean, I think I think you kind of hit the nail on the head in terms of uh, importance here. Uh, it is one of the most uh, important elements for your business strategy is to know who you are selling to, know who your target audience is. And uh, if that's sustainable based on where you live. So in terms of commercial work, uh, you don't necessarily have to live anywhere because a big part of that a lot of times entails you going places. You hopping on a plane is not the end of the world because in the budget, most of those things and costs associated are all part of rental and everything else anyway. So you hopping on a plane is a couple hundred dollars in the grand scheme of a much larger budget. So, um, you know, commercial photographers live everywhere and, and can't. Now, does that necessarily mean that based on their work, it doesn't benefit them to live in certain places? Well, you know, definitely not. I mean, living in a big city or, or living where big companies are based. I think Nike shoots a lot of stuff and works a lot of ad agencies in like Pacific Northwest, uh, stuff like that. So like, it, it makes sense to to be up there so that your images, um, you know, can, can necessitate, you know, the need of, of these companies, but, but you don't necessarily need to be in any one place. So, you know, speaking to whatever genre you happen to do, uh, if that target audience is not, that there's not enough of that target audience uh, where you are, you have to figure out how to, um, you know, make, make your money by, by other means. And there are many, many, many different means for photographers, now, photographers nowadays uh, as supplemental income streams. And so, you know, if maybe 
you know, I, I discovered this photographer the other day who who is this, you know, does these amazingly fantastical projects. And, you know, I, I, I'm talking and they're just so beautifully produced and clearly spent like a ton of time and effort and, and money on these projects. And I said, you know, who, who is hiring you? Like, you know, who, 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 who hires you to create this work? He goes, well, no, I, you know, when in, in, in the country he lived in, he's like, Oh, I have, I have a photography school that, that kind of handles my day to day. And he goes, I do this, like I fund this stuff out of my own pocket. It lets me create the work that I create. And so, you know, whether, whether it be education or, or whether it be shooting different genres, like you, you can find ways to make your money. Um, and, and, you know, you just have to know who the audience and, and what the likelihood of them giving you their money is, you know what I mean? Cause there, there's, let's take, um, uh, hot people photography, right? As an example, and of, of which there's a zillion of these people all over the place. And, you know, maybe this person has a hundred thousand followers on Instagram, but you know, who's hiring them, right? So just because all of these people follow their work, which is a very easy thing to, to accumulate followers to kind of work, doesn't necessarily mean that's translating to income in any way. So you kind of have to figure out um, based on, the business that you do, how you can, um, you know, find customers. I didn't know it was easy to accumulate followers. So <laughs> tell me how to do that because I've been if struggling. You, if, you, if you photograph hot people. Oh yeah. Okay. All right. Really attractive then... people uh, bring uh, the follow to the yard, as they say. Should have known. I should have known. Instead That's of funny. going for those people with character. <laughs> Listen, I, I I I love photographing like wrinkles and old dudes with beards. So, like, clearly that's not my demographic. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, no, that's that's perfect. I mean, we have to look at where we're at and and who is who is going to pay you where you're going to be. But also, um, Kevin, what I'd love to hear you talk about, if you don't mind, is how do you price yourself comparatively? I mean, if you start looking at your market, I wanna be a portrait photographer here in Albuquerque. There's a million other portrait photographers and it seems like not very many people are making above $30,000 a year. Um, am I gonna be able to survive in that market? I mean, when you do that market research for yourself, um, looking at your competitors, what do you have to keep in mind? That's a, that's a tough one. Um, I will say that I've, I've read and I've heard the advice that you should not, um, you should not determine your pricing based off of other photographers in your market. I, I don't really agree with that, but I will say, I think what the, what people who say that are trying to imply is that you shouldn't let that be the sole basis. You can't just go, well, that person's charging, you know, $2,000 for a portrait session and I'm not as good as him, but I'm kind of good. So I'll charge 1500. Like, obviously there's a lot more that goes into it than that. What I think you can do is do your cost of doing business, you know, calculate that, figure out what's appropriate for your unique situation. And then you can kind of confirm, for lack of a better word, if you're in the right ballpark by looking at other photographers and their work. But even then, you can't let that be the deal breaker because, you know, there are so many things that you could be bringing to the table as a photographer that um, are unique to you, what your skill sets are. And so I think that really your, your pricing, if anything, you should be considering uh, your unique skill sets and experience uh, when you're trying to figure out what to charge. And I want to I want to speak on um, this idea of specializing. I don't know if this is straying too much from market research, but I promise I'll try to tie it back in. Um, ba basically, you know, you mentioned living in Albuquerque and um, how some photographers are making this much and. You know, it, it can be kind of a puzzle to try to put it together. You know, the best advice I can say is you got to make your money somehow. So if you're not specializing and you're not doing all portraits and you have to take on weddings and you're doing headshots and stuff like that, I promise you that's more standard um, because it's, it's, it's more standard than you think, you know, because there are so many people who kind of have to be a jack of all trades when they make their money, but they're doing it behind the scenes. 
Um, and what they're showcasing is what they want to be attracting as far as client work, if that makes sense. And so, you know, I, I know plenty of photographers who want to specialize in, in commercial, but they're still doing weddings and they're still doing headshots. Um, and that's what's paying their bills, but they don't necessarily want to advertise for that because they're not necessarily interested in only doing headshots, but they're happy to take on that work behind the scenes and not really post all that on their social media and their website, if that makes sense. And then um, I will say too that I, I don't know, again, if this is directly related to market research, but the advice I have for people who aren't sure if they have a particular client in their market, um, you have to experiment, you know, just because you're attracting only a $200 client doesn't mean that there aren't any clients out there in your market that are willing to pay more. Um, it just means that you have a completely different clientele that you have to cater to uh, with different marketing. If that makes sense. I know that was kind of, that was sort of all over the place, but um, that's that's kind of my thoughts on just market research in general and, and pricing. Yeah, no, it makes sense. And I think, you know, what we're looking at with market research is just making sure, um, you know, it's not that I can't charge New York prices in Albuquerque. It's just that it's going to be a hell of a lot harder, right? Because they're, the community here has an established idea of what they're going to pay if they're going to go see a portrait photographer or a pet photographer or buy a landscape photo. And if I want to charge beyond what the average market prices are, I better have a good reason for that. I better be giving, you know, a certain experience or maybe I'm getting paper that's handmade by an artisan in Uruguay and it's getting framed. But you know what I mean? So, yeah. so we you, have you, to have some. I said you, you have to be you have to be really real with yourself about the fact if the average person can tell that you are worth more, like they're getting a better product than what they would get from someone else if you are charging that much more. Like they have to be able to tell the difference and they got to find value in that and they have to find worth in that. So a lot of times what we do is educating the customer um, in, a, in a polite, non-condescending way about what the experience lends itself to and why there's value in what we do and why we charge what we do. And sometimes it's helpful to show the breakdown of that cost to people. Um, but a lot of times people are much more receptive to paying the higher rate if they know where the money is going. Because if you just say, hey, it's going to cost X, Y, Z, it's going to cost you $2,000 for a second. They go, what the hell is that money going to? This person just walking away $2,000? Well, no, like you have to pay the hairstylist and the makeup artist and their styling and there's food and there's an assistant and like all of these kind of things combined. And no, I'm not walking away with that amount of money, but like this is where the experience goes and this is how they contribute to making your pictures better. This is why we have them. And you know X Y Z, and I think I think people are much more respect, more 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 responsive to that once they they just know. Like most people just don't know. Yeah, for sure. And then also, I think that that just also people need to keep in mind that if you want to charge, you know, New York prices <laughs> in a small city like Albuquerque, um, that might take you some time. I mean, you might be you you can do that, especially if you build your business around this idea of being a luxury business, but right off the bat, am I going to be able to step in and charge somebody 10 grand a portrait session in a, in a community that's used to paying $500? Maybe that's going to take me a while to build up my notoriety and my worth in that area so that when people see me, they know, oh yes, that is worth it. I don't have to convince people anymore. I don't have to fight my way up price-wise anymore. Um, and if that's something you want to do, you absolutely can, but I think you have to be willing for that struggle, right? Like you have to be willing to put in the time. And let's not forget the two thousand dollars. We want to we want to seem like that's what we're worth, but five hundred dollars is a ton of money for an, a regular person. Right? That's exactly. still a lot. Of, like people just you, you gotta you gotta be receptive to that. Yeah, yeah. Agreed. I want to say I want to say also that it's it's really easy for a lot of people to use their location almost as a limiting belief. And you know, I think that universally, when someone thinks of a expensive part of the country, they think New York. They think Los Angeles or, or San Francisco. And so if they're living in a small, more rural area, they might think, oh, you know, I'm never going to be able to charge more than X amount. 
And what I want to say to that is just like geographically, there tends to be areas where there are clients with larger budgets and a, a willingness to pay more for luxury. There are subsets of those clients within those regions. And so because just because I live in a small beach town, you know, uh, compared, you know, uh, on, on average, the client is, is probably spending less than in a bigger market like New York and California. Sure. But in my experience, there are people even in a, my small town who are willing to pay $2,000 for a portrait session or however much for prints or, you know, five or 6,000 for a luxury wedding. And so I think while it's important to factor in where you live and be realistic about your pricing, you should also know that there are people out there, there are clients out there who are going to be willing to spend more, um, even if they live in a smaller market. Yeah, fantastic point. So just to break down where we've been so far, we talked a little bit about salary and, and how you wanna base that on real numbers on what you need in order to survive and, and thrive um, the business type and then market research. So looking at not only who you are gonna be competing with and what the general market expects from photographers in your area, but also who are you targeting? Who is your ideal client? And how do you kind of educate and can, I don't wanna say convince them, but convince them to pay you what you need to earn. So having gone through things like your salary, your business type and market research, now we're gonna start approaching one that I know a lot of people get stuck on um, and that's the cost of doing business. And it seems to be that there's a lot of mystery in this area. So let's see what we can break down. And obviously we can't get into the exact minutia, but let's see what we can give people as far as what are some of the average things that get rolled up into this whole cost of doing business. And what does cost of doing business actually really mean, you guys? What does it mean? Who should go first? <laughs> yeah, who do you want to go first on? <laughs> um, okay, well, cost of doing business, uh, you know, anything related to uh, having your business uh, successfully running, right? So um, common things, website, um, if you have a bookkeeper or accountant, or if you have software, uh, obviously, Photoshop, Lightroom, things like that. Everything that helps you run your business um, should be con it's considered a cost of doing business. Um, fees that you pay uh, with your bank or your credit card or whatever, all of that. And so I think um, it, it gets interesting going back to the LLC conversation and, and just being a legal structure. One of my favorite things is writing off these business-related expenses because I get a tax deduction and reduces my taxable income, which is nice. So um, yeah, I, I think that um, you know when you're considering your cost of doing business, especially when it comes to doing your taxes, like really factor in every single thing related, including for those who don't know that if you are if you have an office in your house, um, you take the square footage of the office as it relates to your house, and that that's tax deductible. So there are there are lots of things that um, that you can kind of consider. And it's important to do so. Yeah, agreed. Chris. And your car. And your car. And your car. Absolutely. Like those are those are, I think two of the bigger ones. Yeah. But I'm mean, it, 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 it definitely Yeah, I mean it definitely benefits you to really itemize this and and you know uh, this is this is where having that separate account and the separate card, um, you know, all of those things come into play. Um, you know, for you in the long term, so you have to you spreadsheet it down. Where am I spending my money? Where if I'm spending money on, you know, what are my car expenses that that directly relate to this, or you know, travel expenses that directly relate to this, food expenses. Food is like a like it's a sneaky one. Like when you're when you're buying lunch for people on set or whatever, like that one that one comes into play and becomes really expensive, and it will will shock the crap out of you with how expensive that is. Um, like uh, in the long run. Um, itemize these things, figure out where th things are costing you money and, and how you can kind of, you know, figure, figure that out for yourself. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I'm kind of reminding people to keep in mind when you're looking at your cost of doing business, um, you better factor your insurance in there and you need to be paying attention to your taxes as well. But also if you're going to be hiring contractors, if you're going to be paying freelancers, um, those are all things that will be included in your cost of doing business. And please, please, for the love of God, include your include marketing in there as well. Mm. You need to be including marketing and advertising because if you're not setting aside 
expenses for that, um, your your revenue is going to dry up, and that goes into your cost of doing business. Yeah, but also the cost of your prints. Yes. Mm -hmm. No, please. Like, if you have a thought there, um, give because. Yeah, I mean, it also so. It depends hugely on like this and this is like, this, this doesn't really speak to cost of doing business. It's just, it's purely a marketing thing. Like you want to make sure your marketing money is targeted in a way that uh, makes sense to, to who your target audience is. And this is where that whole know who your audience is, is really relevant. Um, kind of where that targeted spending for marketing goes, like as, as, as popular as it is to, to all over Facebook at the moment. And I get it. Like I'm, I'm on board with, with that, but you know, almost all of my marketing and ad spend goes into Facebook advertising because it's so robust for us. Like it's, it's bad for being the end user, but it's great for being a business owner who markets on Facebook. And so this is one of those things like, remember when the documentary came around and it was like, I can't believe Facebook does all this stuff and it's awful. And I can't believe they're tracking me in this way. I'm like, yeah, no, the people, People don't know this. Like this is this is part of my business strategy. I'm well aware of this is what people do. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like uh, yeah, I know. Yeah, like uh, yeah, no, I know, I know, I know it tracks you. That's the whole point of it. Like, and thank God uh, for that because I can pay my bills. <laughs> yeah. So so like always kind of having 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 that, and then oh, and taxes. Taxes are just you know if you're paying quarterly, it's 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 nowhere near the hurt. But if you you know if you pay once a year, I mean it's just it's, that is not a fun check to write, to write once a year. Um, yeah. Like, well, I can buy this one, car. This new car. I can pay my taxes. Pay my taxes. <laughs> but one, <laughs> one thing, one piece of advice I have for people to kind of avoid that, that, you know, uh, really painful once a year, I have to pay, you know, pay that big tax bill is to set aside, um, you know, 25 to 30% of your income and just put it into uh, an account, a savings account that, you know, might even yield you a small amount of interest over the course of the year. And that way you're not just having to scrounge up what you have at the end of the year. Just, you know, every time a client pays you take, you know, 30% and put it into an account. And that I found that that's been really helpful. You know, I have that money ready. And oftentimes I'm, that 30% for me, at least is a bit of uh, an overestimation. So I'm never depleting that account fully, which is which is nice because I'd rather have a little bit left over than um, have to dig into other accounts to pay my tax bill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a fantastic point. So guys, cost of doing business, make sure you're keeping in mind all of the hard costs. Um, and But then you also want to keep in mind that um, your cost of goods is included in that. So if you are selling prints, your prints are going to be included in your cost of doing business. Um, you know, um, any physical marketing material, all of those, um, your office supplies, all of that stuff is included in the cost of doing business as well. If you books. run a mail, what's that? Photo books. Yeah, all of that, man. And, and if you have an email list, that is included in your cost of doing business. If you're running 100,000 emails and you're paying, God, it's an ungodly mail, amount. Mail to, uh, has gotten so expensive. It, it's bad, man. It's bad. I mean, it's it can oh, be a man. huge source of income, but you better be prepared for what it's going to cost you. So include that. That in was that was definitely business. something that that I didn't get into until much later when I was, uh, I was you know my partner was like you gotta you gotta build your email list. It's just like oh. you know it's it's so huge and valuable to you. Why aren't you collecting emails? And so I made it a much more conscious effort to, to start kind of accumulating that. But holy, holy shit, like $200 a month to maintain that list is an insane amount of money. Oh yeah. And it just, it exponentially grows. The more people that you get on your list, it just gets worse too. So um, just want to make sure that everybody's keeping in mind when you're starting to build your overall pricing structure, you're looking at your salary, you're looking at your business type, you're doing your market research, you're building that cost of doing business, and then you're adding all of those things together, right? So what you make added to the cost of what your business needs to earn in order to function, and you're going to find really quickly that number is probably way, way higher than what you initially thought. And that's why that market research is so important, because you may find out, okay, in order to run the business I want to run, me plus business must earn $200,000 a year. What can I cut out in order to make 
in, in order to change that. Maybe I don't give champagne this first year. Maybe I don't, whatever it is, you, you might have to figure out. And like Kevin was saying, you know, look at what you can deduct in your taxes. And maybe those things start making up the difference for you so that you can't afford to give the kind of service that you want. But once you add your salary to your cost of doing business and you look at market research, then you're going to have a much better idea of what you need to earn per shooting day. And I think that's the big thing to keep in mind is, we have this idea when we're building, it's 365 days a year, right? And we forget that, well, maybe we're not working weekends and we need to have some sick days and we're probably going to want some vacation. And you're not, probably you're not going to be shooting five days a week. Probably you're going to be shooting two or three days a week and doing paperwork and marketing and talking to clients and selling and doing everything else the other days a week. So you have to divide that number then by the amount of shooting days that you have and then look at, okay, so it looks to me like I need to earn $2,000 per shoot day in order to pay myself when I'm not shooting and to pay my my salary and to have my business actually earning money. And I think people forget that when they start putting these numbers together that you're, you're not actually shooting all the time. Most of the time you're, you're shooting a couple days. Very little compared to everything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So keeping that in mind, um, let's talk a little bit about product pricing and into this is going to fall things like also licensing and usage because that doesn't get talked about a whole bunch. But for some people, their product is a physical print that they're handing over. And for some people, their product is licensing their images to companies who are going to use them to sell stuff. So guys, when we look at um, when we look at product pricing, what are some things that we need to keep in mind? And um, Chris, let's start with you on this one. And maybe we can look at this from a, a more of a commercial standpoint. Sure. I mean, um, I, I'll actually speak, speak to both. So if you are, if you are running prints from a, a retail perspective, um, I think uh, it's important to note not just the pure cost of a print, uh, you also need to kind of bring your time into that and what that looks like and, and reflect that in the prices. Like if it costs you $2 to get a print from Adorama, you don't want to charge three bucks. Uh, you got to kind of figure out if someone only orders one print, um, what's worth your time to handle that, right? Uh, and then if you're printing from your own printer, like, you know, you have the cost of, you don't do that to save money. You know, you have to, buy the paper, you have to buy the printer, you have to buy the ink. We all know how expensive, you know, if we print, that can be. You you print yourself because it's a quality thing, not because it's a cost saving thing. And so, you know, you want to reflect that in what that lends itself to, to your business model. From a commercial perspective, um, this is something that we're seeing change. And as wonderful as it would be to, to open up Blinkbid or you know, one of the other programs that gives you a quote, um, those those numbers aren't gleamed from as many people as they used to be 10, 10 20 years ago, like the, the percentages, because the way that the budgets are now divvied up is it's not just, you know, the, the, ad, the ad budget doesn't just go to photography spend. It's also incorporating a lot of times social media and, and sometimes video production as well. And so uh, sometimes those those budgets do go up, but it's still split amongst more people. And so, you know, we we have to kind of reconcile what those usage numbers look like in, in kind of the modern world. And as, as wonderful as it would be to say, I want to license this one image for twenty thousand dollars. I mean, still working with with huge, huge corporations, we're not always getting those numbers anymore. And we just kind of have to be a little bit more realistic uh, about what those numbers happen to be, and and be a little bit more okay with the. Um, disposable nature of images nowadays. Uh, you know, you, you'd have these images that were shot for a campaign and they'd live everywhere for, for four months, six months. And now we just kind of, you know, they, they go up and they're around for a month and then you don't see them anymore. And so I think, you know, those factors kind of contribute to, you know, the diminishment of, of it and something we have to kind of, you know, be okay with. So when somebody is talking about, okay, um, you know, maybe my main product, I'm, I'm working with businesses and, I, you know, I'm going to be licensing images to them. How does somebody then go to decide 
what they charge for that? Are they looking at things like Blinkbit or other places? Or are they going, this is what I need to earn. I can work with this many clients a year. Divide that by by images. I mean, how do how do people... I know I mean, this is a rough one. <laughs> it's 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 challenging because if you know in in an ideal world you have a really good relationship, or you have you have either a good relationship with the person who's in charge, who's who's setting those budgets, or is who's in charge of the you know the producer, and you know if best case scenario, I go listen, you tell me what the budget is, and I will do my best to tell you what I can fit within that budget. And so that's generally my preferred approach, how I would rather go with it, because I know what needs to be included and what doesn't versus me giving you a budget that's wildly out of the ballpark, which is going to disqualify me from even getting my foot in the door. If you, you know, if, if, if you know, I've had this with like, with network networks, like actual channel, like doing an ad campaign for a show and I go, okay, like, I would expect to charge you 20 grand for this image you know, for the, for this, for the shoot. And they come in and go, our budget's six, right? I'm like I would be so far out of the ballpark if I just came in at 20. And so I say, why don't you tell me what the budget is and we'll work backwards from there. And if I have to remove some stuff or just be okay with it, that's just a decision that we have to make. And sometimes you just kind of go, well, listen, it's a cool job. And I like the people and they're going to be cool images and I'm okay with taking less money. That happens. It's, it's, it's kind of like it, it depends and it, yeah. it wildly depends. You know, some of my highest paying jobs that I've ever had have been some of the easiest, most unassuming work. <laughs> and, and then, you know, I've had stuff that was wildly complicated. That was really, really cheap. Yep. Yeah, and so, so it's got to come down to the individual, right? Yeah, totally depends. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, Kevin, what are your thoughts on product pricing? And then, of course, maybe we're looking at hard products and maybe we're looking at things like license and usage fees. Yeah, I, I think Chris did a really good job of explaining that. And that's my experience, too, is that, you know, th there are so many ways to get to the answer, the answer being the ideal budget or your ideal budget. Um, certainly, you know, uh, it's not for the faint of heart. Not everyone is comfortable uh, coming out and asking the client what their budget is, but I think that's a very valid strategy or, or, or way of going about finding out. Because like you said, if you, if you are kind of way off, if you just kind of price yourself out of the equation, it's really kind of uh, tough to recover from that. So, um, the other thing I would encourage people to do is to cross reference with all of your photographer friends who shoot commercial or retail, depending on what you shoot and really kind of figure out, um, you know, what might make sense depending on the context, you know, like if I am given uh, a request for proposal and they're saying, you know, we, we want this done for a shoot, let us know what the rate's going to be. And I really just don't know where to start which happens more often than I'd like to admit, because you know there are so many factors to consider. Um, the first thing I do is I, I call up or I, I chat with my photographer friends who I know have done similar projects. And I, I kind of talk out the logistics with them and say, okay, well, here's what's gonna happen. It's gonna be a four day shoot and they're looking for this kind of licensing and, and we lay it all out. And then from there, I start to get a better idea of what I should be charging. And uh, you start you start to factor in your specific situation, like what market you're in and your experience, and then it becomes a little bit easier. You're really kind of putting the pieces of the puzzle together. So, the first thing I would say is to um, is to really consult with your colleagues. You know, that's the value of the community. Um, you know, I, that's why I, I've always placed an emphasis on um, building up this community and, and instead of competition, because it really kind of helps everyone involved determine what they should be charging. Um, and I want to speak on the, the part where Chris was talking about how um, images don't last very long. And, and, you know, it's kind of like the shelf life of an image now compared to 10, 20 years ago, it's, it's, it's very much ephemeral. Um, and because of that, I actually feel like that's a bargaining chip that we can use to our advantage as photographers. And what I mean by that is if you find that you, you're in a situation where you price high and the client is... It's like, man, that's that's way too high. We 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 just don't have the budget for that. Here's what we're looking for. You're able to come down on your usage 
and say, all right, well, you know what? You probably don't need unlimited usage in perpetuity, or we don't need a full buyout or a copyright transfer. A lot of times clients have this in mind where they're like, we need everything. We want to own everything because we're going to, and like, you're, you're not going to need that for eight years, you know? And sometimes they do, granted. Sometimes, sometimes companies know what they're talking about and they want to use those assets for a long time. However, a lot of businesses and, and brands are looking for images that they're realistically going to be using for no longer than six months, if that. And so if you find that you're pricing high, you can always come down on your usage. And, and by doing so, you can come down on your fees that's a closer to the budget that they have in mind. So I really feel like it can be confusing and overwhelming. Uh, pricing is something that can be tricky, especially with the industry changing constantly. We'll get into NFTs and all that, and that's that could this makes things even more complicated. But uh, the the answer to this is to you, you really kind of have to just take it one step at a time, and there's always an answer, even if that answer is that you have to pass on the job. Sometimes that's going to be the case. Yeah, that's a really good point. Did you have any follow ups to that, Chris? I, I do find it really really funny because you, you you mentioned that you know they don't necessarily want it for perpetuity and that's absolutely correct it's like listen you only really want this for six months let's just structure this down to that and so we can meet where you want to be and you use it for the amount of time you're going to use it anyway it's going to save you some money and these a lot of times you have the legacy companies though they'll go nope we want to own it forever i'm like mines yeah it's there. There we're we're in a time where they haven't quite, or they're going the opposite route where they say, you know what, we want everything and we want it for that price. So maybe they're maybe taking advantage of it a little bit. I, I don't know. Like I, it's, it's I I do find you run into pushback on that. Is like some some clients are very receptive to it and totally get it, and then some people just completely double down. They go, nope, we want to give you five hundred dollars to own this image. You know what I mean? Like you have, right. you have that. I feel like also one thing that a lot of clients or companies will do is they will, they'll try to play the poor card and say, well, you know, we don't have much of a budget, but it's only going to be for social. And I was actually right. ranting to Nicole about this earlier today. I feel like, you know, 20 years ago, that was more applicable, like maybe social because it didn't exist 20 years ago. Right. So the advertising was the, the top, the most uh, attention you can get. A, a billboard was this, like the mecca of advertising. But now it's arguable that if someone's going to use an image for social, they're they're getting more attention. How many people are driving down the road, not even looking at the, at the road and not even looking oh, at the billboard? Oh, it's just social and web. Well. Exactly. So, yeah. so I you mean where everybody can see it, where everybody goes, because nobody's leaving exactly. right now. <laughs> it is the epitome of that's the most valuable usage that you could ask for. And so, if any photographer comes across where a client's like, "Well, we only we only want it for social," you can just completely disregard that and and take the take the value of the image for what it is. If they're using it for social, that is the backbone of their marketing strategy, and you should be pricing accordingly. It's really, really important. I hope people take that to heart. Um, and just for the retail photographers in there, I want to break this down just a little bit because we we talked a little bit about licensing and usage, which is fantastic. But there are a lot of photographers out there going, but how do I price my prints? Do I give people packages or prints? And how do I know what to charge for those? And um, it kind of comes back to the same thing that we were talking about before, which is, you know, once you know how many shoot days you can have, and then you go, okay, I know that I need to earn $2,500 per client when I shoot in order to make my minimum. So maybe what I do is I take that $2,500 and I say $500 is the retainer. And then my, my prints start at, if it's a la carte, they need to be priced high enough that if somebody decides to buy two images, you're, you're not going to completely fall. Or if you're putting your prints together into a package that your lowest package might be what the minimum is you need in order to get by. And there's literally a million different ways that you can combine um, prints, experience, um, albums, all of those kinds of things, um, depending on what your clientele want, expect from you, what you want to sell. But you have to recognize that you need to be able to meet that minimum per shoot day so that you can then you can change that how you want. Maybe your print is $50 and you sell a, a 
folio of 25 prints and maybe that your constant push is to get them to buy the folio or maybe you're looking at um, the experience itself is what you sell um, and maybe the prints are kind of an extra thing so you you keep the print package low but the cost of the session is a little bit high so it really just depends on how you want to structure what your business looks like but you you have to keep in mind when you're looking at any type of product that you're selling whether it's to businesses or to retail clients what do I have to earn from this client in order to pay my bills? And if that's, I, I can afford to license this. So um, just as a quick example, I have one of my images is up on World Builders Market, which is a charity foundation that's basically kind of run by um, fantasy nerds. So, you know, Patrick Rothfuss is the one that started it, who wrote um, the, the King Killer Chronicles. So it's basically just a way for fantasy authors in the community to, in, you know, to give back and help people. And so they contacted me and wanted to use one of my images. And so the whole discussion on licensing goes down there and well, who is this for? Am I cool with just, you know what, I'm excited to, to just be part of giving back. And so maybe I'll keep my fee really low because I'm excited to be part of this project. Or maybe I shot this knowing I have to earn money from this image. And if I don't, I'm not going to be paying my bills. And then in that case, maybe I push a little bit harder for a fee that helps me take care of myself. So, um, yes. But Say the thing. <laughs> when you donate to nonprofit mm -hmm. work, that becomes a charitable tax deduction. Yeah, absolutely. So, so it, that's it, that's important. And so you can you can place the value on your work that you determine on your tax form. Yes, you can. So, so that's an that important goes back. One yes. million dollars. <laughs> One million dollars. Um, yeah, but hopefully, you know, people just just really take into account that your your products that's what you earn from that's that's how you live and so they have to be priced to pay what you need to earn to live and if you know i i know that i can sell 500 prints in a month i know that i need to make eight thousand dollars in a month divide those numbers sucker i mean start start using the hard numbers as a basis that doesn't mean that it will be that exactly but you you have to have a baseline to work from at least right because if i want to license this image for 50 dollars but i need to earn eight hundred thousand dollars a month in order to survive i'm shooting myself in the foot you know i'm, I'm being it's a lot of expenses but <laughs> well i'm pretty fabulous i have to take care of all this hair god i have no hair it's so sad it's i, I want to get into that anyway moving on all right so <laughs> product pricing uh, it's what like one of my my biggest things that i feel bad about myself is my lack of hair um so anyway Product, product. That's why I'm so jealous. Like Chris keeps like tucking his hair behind his ears. He's got all this thick, <laughs> fabulous hair. I'm like, you, you, you yeah. bastard. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, um, I didn't know. I thought I had him. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. I took that in a completely it's different right. direction. That's Moving right. on. All right. I mean, so we've talked a lot. Yes. No, as I say, at least you don't have to deal with like male pattern bald. Hey, which I have to severely, do severely runs in life. I've been. <laughs> I've been terrified of losing my hair my entire life. So look like, at the like, glorious set of hair you have, though. No, like all my cousins, I, I'm the only. My mom's, my mom's like got a like a huge family, and every male in the family started losing their hair at 17. I am the only one of like 30 guys that have their hair as an adult. That's wild. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it's obviously a blessed head of hair. <laughs> I have I have a massive forehead, but I still have I you still have my hair for now. All right, whatever. Now I feel like we're gonna start fighting about it. Okay. So, <laughs> all right. So we have talked about kind of building this up. So we're looking at your salary, what you need to learn and earn in order to survive. We looked at your business type, the market research that you need to do, the cost of doing business and how that factors into how you price your products. Now we've only got a couple things left. So let's move through them relatively quickly. We're going to talk about getting established. So when you're looking at how you price your work, um, both Kevin and Chris have mentioned this, then you have, all right. <laughs> 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 oh my god oh boy yeah that's don't want you to hard. hate me that's i i don't i'm just deeply jealous that's all so um Blanketed. establishing yourself so maybe what i want to earn guys maybe what i really want to earn i want to make six figures i want to earn a hundred thousand dollars a year that's what i think it's going to take for me to live in the house i want to care of my kids maybe vacation have some savings maybe that's what i really want to be 
the average photographer in my area is probably entering the market at $40,000. Getting established, what does that look like? Is this a time where I need to think, okay, maybe I start off a little bit lower so that I can build my reputation in this market and raise my prices as I go? Do I step in hardcore and be like, it's $10,000 portrait image, take it or leave it. I'm fabulous. Come at me, suckers. Like, how do we start approaching this? Um, Kevin, let's start with you. Um, I, I do think that it's 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 valid to start with a lower, you know, um, sitting fee or or shooting fee, day rate, however you want to call it. Uh, if you're first starting out, and I don't necessarily think this is this is cutting into the other photographers of your community because there are, for lack of a better term, brackets. You know, uh, you're going to be you're going to be catering to a specific clientele when you're first starting out, you know, um, a luxury client or a uh, high end commercial client probably has enough taste to know if you have a lot of experience, if your work is good enough to be commanding a high rate. And if not, then you'll, you're going to be charging, you're going to be attracting um, the clients um, that are appropriate to your skill level and experience, if that makes sense. So, I do think that charging lower is okay at first if you are um, doing it part time, or yeah, if, especially if you're doing it part time. Um, but I do think that it's important to continually raise your rate as you gain experience, as you become better, and as you start to attract more clients, especially recurring clients. Um, and when you, you'll get to the point where you know that you can sustain yourself. If you have those returning clients and you're consistently meeting your uh, your bottom line, really good insight, um, Chris. Do you have any thoughts about that? Do you agree? Do you disagree? Uh, I I agree. I think I think kind of what you were saying originally. You, you got to live somewhere in the middle. Um, you know, know, knowing your value is important. Also, being realistic with where you sit in the spectrum in the, in those brackets, um, and, and being very honest with. Um, what your experience level is, as Kevin said, and, and what your talent level is as well. Um, you you have to you have to kind of kind of know know where you live, and then continually try to improve so that you can you can reach those those higher numbers. Um, you know, so I think somebody told me years and years ago if if you're to the point where you're overwhelmed with work, you can increase your rate. And if you're not getting any work, you have to lower your rate. And I think you just kind of have to use that as a little bit of a spring point. Now, sometimes, you know, there are other factors at play besides you're charging too much or too little. Um, but, you know, it's, it's not, not necessarily bad advice in the abstract. Yeah, for sure. So when we look at that period of getting established, um, and, and let's compare that. So maybe I took my salary and this is, I need to earn $50,000 in order to survive. And I figured out that my cost of doing business combined with my salary is probably gonna be 150. So let's say 150K a year, that's probably what I need to run my business, carry my insurance, update my gear, continue my education, pay my bills, you know, save for my taxes, all of that stuff. But in my area, I'm having a hard time pulling in the kind of clients that I need in order to pay that. So what does that look like for me trying to establish myself in this market? Am, am I going to go, okay, maybe I got to figure out how to cut my costs of doing business. Do I look at my marketing and say, maybe I'm not marketing to the right people in the right places, or maybe do I need to say, I'm going to have to drop my, my quality of living for a little while until I've earned that reputation. Like are, is that valid to, to need to do those things? Or do you think maybe that's, a mistake? Um, will, will clients think less of you if you're starting low? Will it be h harder to to establish yourself? I mean, that's I think. Well, that's a good question. Um, we'll, we'll say that one more time about about what clients think of you if you were starting off lower. What did you mean by that, Nicole? So mostly, um, you know, for people who are, let's say, if I know I want to have, you know, a six figure business and I know I want to be making this, you know, much money for selling, I want to be selling a luxury product. Am I going to be able to get to those people if in my past I was charging $200? Um, is that, oh, do I have I to see. start? 
from a luxury place to end up in a luxury place? Um, or do I just have to be willing to, to scratch my way to the top and be okay with not making as much money for a while? Like, Yeah, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, uh, but, you know, in my experience, again, thinking in terms of brackets, thinking in terms of client brackets, um, you're kind of moving down, right? Um, I don't know if I want to mention this publicly, but I'm just going to. I've already committed to it. I used to play. I used to play poker online, right? And if you're if you're going to be practical and smart about uh, playing poker and not going bust and just losing all your money, what you want to do is you want to move up when it's right, and then if if things are not going your way, you kind of move down appropriately, right? I view the same thing with clients. If you're not meeting your bills and you're not meeting whatever standard you've set for yourself and your client is in this bracket of, let's say, 800 to 1200 is the price point that you are marketing for. Well, and that, if that's not working for you, what you can do is move down to the bracket that's more kind of a budget friendly, you know, a few hundred dollars per shoot. And what that means, of course, is that you're going to have to do, take on more volume and perhaps even cut down on your costs, on your uh, living expenses and, and whatnot. Um, to make it work. But then what you can do is once things are working again, you've picked up enough volume, you can kind of take that shot again at uh, reaching that other clientele. And once you do that, I think making the move to the luxury market or the high end market, sometimes it takes time to kind of establish your footing. You know, it's not like you just go there and you get your first, you get your first high paying client and you're set from there, from there on out and it's easy. Um, sometimes it takes time for you to kind of get the word out about your business and really es establish a foothold in that particular market or that bracket. But once you do, and once that word of mouth starts going, I find that it tends to stick. Um, so really it's about giving it time and allowing yourself the, uh, the, you know, giving yourself the wiggle room if it doesn't work out. There's no shame in moving down your price point and uh, trying to go after a different market um, while you try to work your business to the market that you're trying to be in, if that makes sense. Yeah, Kevin's absolutely right. I mean, you're not, you're not jumping and comparing price points and clients from week to week or month to month. You are playing the long game here. And you can't go like, oh, listen, I took this cheap client today. Does that mean I'm not going to get an expensive client tomorrow? It's not how you got to look at it. Um, you, you are not going to jump from low end to high end from week to week and back and forth. Uh, it is a, a strategy that you're going to implement on the long term. And yeah, it's going to take a while to be uh, to get your foothold into, let's say, that demographic. Because what's going to happen is you're slowly going to work yourself up. And then eventually you're going to get hired by somebody in the social circle that you want. And then their friends are going to see it and then someone else is going to hire you and someone else is going to hire you. And this is going to take a long time. It's not going to take months. It's going to take years uh, unless you are so mind-blowingly exceptional that so you're going to come on the scene and people are going to be like, oh, my God, I have to use this person. They're a genius, which totally happens, but it's not the normal way it happens. You're muted again. I found having to move with my business several years that uh, it takes about two years in general for me. What I've noticed is it takes about two years to establish myself enough in a market that I'm regularly getting people contacting me for work. So at least, at least, yeah, yeah. So, so that's definitely something to keep in mind. So, go ahead, Kevin. I, I was going to say. Uh, as far as like figure, as far as pushing through, right? You, you mentioned lowering your your business expenses, your or your living expenses, and trying to make it work. Obviously, you can be as tenacious as possible. Um, if you want, if you love photography and you're really committed to doing this, then you're, yeah, try and experiment with different marketing. Like you know, go door to door if you have to. There are tons of things you can do to try to get your market. But so, the reality is, sometimes it just is not going to work for you. And what that means is that you might have to get a part-time job or even a full-time job and make photography your your side gig. There is absolutely no shame in that. I think that a lot of people view having to do so as a failure. They're like, oh God, well, I can't do photography because I just didn't make it work as a full-time career. And it's like, maybe that's not what's meant for you right now. And I don't mean like this like spiritual, like it's not written in the stars. I just mean practically speaking. 
you can't have right it. i'm just being practically speaking if it's not working out for you you've tried your best do what you have to do get a part-time job don't put that undue pressure on yourself God, making so it in this awesome. business it's so hard it's so so hard and uh but it is doable so really it's just about giving yourself a fair shot and being realistic about about your situation and like i said if you if you have to move down and and, and gonna when i say move down if you have to uh cut your hours of a photography business and make it a part-time thing until you're able to get your footing that's totally okay yeah i i think um that's seems to be kind of a taboo thing because a lot of people make this assumption that the people they admire and all the people that they see are purely living off the income of their photos all the time and they don't see like we talked about before all the other stuff that goes on behind the scenes maybe we're you know selling um maybe we're also shooting weddings but we didn't tell anybody or maybe we're selling actions or you know we teach a workshop or we do these other things that help us kind of stay afloat and pay our bills um, and, and nobody ever wants to talk about that because for some reason we have this idea that if I admit the fact that I'm earning a decent amount of my income from this other area, maybe I'm not as good of a photographer or I'm not sure what that taboo is, but it definitely seems to be there. I mean, good, good business is like understanding how to bring in multiple revenue streams. And I mean, this last year is, is has proven anything it's that when one thing dries up if you don't have other income coming in i mean you're you're in a tough spot you know i mean you you, you gotta you gotta find ways to bring in to bring in income from from different places yeah so people need not be ashamed if you are working a part-time job or moving on to the final topic if you're just a hobbyist and you just want to do this sometimes because you love it and you make a little bit of money on the side. That does not mean you are not a legitimate photographer. It just means running a photography business was not for you. And that is okay. In fact, for some of us, it will make us a hell of a lot happier to just do what we love when we can instead of having to turn it into a job. It also doesn't mean you can't be a great photographer. I mean, look at Vivian Mayer. I mean, she's undiscovered as a photographer in her time, but we look back and, you know, an amazing street photographer and she was a nanny. You know what I mean? Like she did photography on the side. It was brilliant. Like that doesn't necessarily mean you're not a good photographer and you're absolutely right. It just means you don't want to run a business or you want to be able to say no to things, which yeah, I'm, exactly. I'm a big fan of. I, yeah, I, not, I not, teach not, myself. Not in like the, I mean, you know what I mean? Like jobs that, that don't pay enough or, or aren't something you're particularly excited about. You go, you know what, listen, that's maybe just not a great fit for me versus going, you know, and I have to take this because I need to put food on the table. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then just keeping in mind for hobbyists, guys, um, do, is it, would it be your opinion? Let's say I'm a hobbyist and I want to sell some prints on the side and, you know, for, of whatever, whatever it is. Should I look at pricing my prints as to how that affects the market as a whole? Or should I look at that as whatever I decide is totally fine? Like, am I going to be hurting the photography market if I'm selling prints at 50 bucks and other people are trying to make an income off of photography and they're, they're banking on the general consensus that prints are $100, $200 a piece? <laughs> Thanks, Chris. <laughs> well, what I've learned. He just likes about... to say, I totally agree with Kevin. <laughs> yeah, no, like my job really because you come on, you sound really smart, and you sound oh, like you know what you're talking about. And I go, uh, I concur. I'm like Leonardo DiCaprio, and uh, catch me if you can. I concur. <laughs> I concur. Now you just get to be the guy who's like, you get to be like, Do you yeah, concur, Chris, Kevin? I concur. I concur. Chris I concur. agrees with I everything I say. It's good. I think what I've learned about, about art and, and pricing as it relates to art, especially within these last few months, uh, is it's just such a vast, it's so subjective. And the value truly is in, in the mind of the beholder, you know? And so I don't think someone who decides to charge $50 for their print is damaging the market unless, you know, that it became a thing where 99% of people who produce fine art prints were also charging $50. And then, then the, the rest of them were like, what are you guys, what are you guys doing? What, what precedent are you trying to establish here? Um, I, I think that you need, you just need to be pricing it uh, according to what you believe it's, it's going to be, it's worth and what it can sell for. And uh, one piece of advice, I don't, I don't sell fine art prints, but I've sold prints before. I don't, I wouldn't consider them fine art, but, um, 
you know, I, I, I made some decent money with prints before. And what I've learned is as an artist, you, you have to ignore those material costs and you have to ignore um, pricing as it relates to how much it costs you. As Chris was saying earlier, just because it costs you $2 doesn't mean that you're limited to charging it for no more than three. You have to remember that if you're selling prints, you are selling art. You are not selling the paper and the ink. Anyone can sell that. You're selling the, the what you've created, the creation that you're giving to the client to have and to appreciate for however long. And so when you think about it that way, the ceiling for what you're able to charge becomes much higher. Obviously, there still is a cap, but it's not limited to, okay, I paid two, so I can only I can only charge four. So um, yeah, the sky is the limit, truly. And, and I keep mentioning uh, NFTs because most, of, most people in the art world and photography even are, are aware of, of people's $69 million NFT sale. Um, it, he sold it for a tremendous amount of money and it was a JPEG file. And that's not to diminish the truly incredible art that he created. Um, but the long story short is uh, what you create has a particular value or a range of value and you never really know how much someone is willing to pay for it. I agree with Kevin. I care. <laughs> All right guys, good night. <laughs> you don't even we don't even need to be here. We're just going to be like, yeah, we yeah. agree just let Kevin yeah. do his thing. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, he, in terms of, of where things are going as well, it, it is drastically changing. I, I think photography has had a really good run of, of uh, creating the thing and living in kind of a physical world and speaking to the cost of the print. It's not about what it costs you to physically make the print. You're right. It is, it is about this tangible object that someone now owns, this physical manifestation of work. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the, the art world is, is changing dramatically, um, uh, as of the last few months and especially the last you know, month ish. Um, I mean, I, I think it, it's photography hasn't quite found its foothold in the NFT market. And this is a whole other conversation. I know, I know many people are trying to, um, it's just because we lived in this kind of real world that's favored static images for quite a while. I think NFT thing is, is much more um, something that speaks to moving images and, and, and art that's specifically digital um, because that hasn't had um, its level of, I use this word loosely, not, not what I mean, but credibility that, that the physicality of the print has has given to to photography and painting and stuff like that. And so this is this is really just a platform that that, that lends that that level of credibility to, to the digital medium and, and the motion of motion stuff. And I think that's kind of why it's just um, kind of going through the roof and, and, and people are really just having you know, I've, I've got friends who have become literal overnight millionaires uh, because of this. And it's just, I'm so happy for them because they've, they've been doing digital art for 15 years. And this is finally kind of this, this, this huge moment for them. I mean, it's, it's awesome. what's happening. Yeah, absolutely. And um, literal overnight millionaires, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, shoot, Kate just made 20 grand off of, you know, Within and, a couple and days, like all this, it's, and it's an amazing image, and I'm yeah. so happy for. Her. But photography as the static thing is it's not still, quite right. taking off as much as that's, and that's why we're seeing photographers are coming to the face, are starting to incorporate moving elements into it as well. Yeah, absolutely, and yeah. So I think when we when we look at this as a whole, what we've talked about, kind of as a whole, and pricing, and and what that looks like. Um, from a concrete perspective, taking your salary, I'm just gonna repeat myself one more time, um, taking your salary, combining that with your business type, the market research for that area, your cost of doing business, putting all of those numbers together so you can figure out what your product pricing is and how much you need to earn per client in order to survive. The time it might take you to get established, maybe your ideal and what it's gonna take to get where you want is gonna take you a little while. And so you might have to cut corners and pinch 
down some of those costs or maybe not include certain things or maybe just lower your salary a little bit if you can um, while you establish yourself in that market. And then if you're looking at things like um, being a hobbyist, that's a great way to make amazing work that you where you can still make a living and you don't have to fight for your place in that market in general. And then if you're looking at fine arts, um, the sky is the limit because what you're selling is an experience. So we might think that it's the print, but it's not. And we might even think that it's owning a thing physically, but it's not. What you're selling is the experience that somebody gets when they look at what you've made, when they interact with it. It's that experience that people are buying. When I see this, it makes me feel this way. And so even though like holding the thing and having the provenance of that, of course, it gives you the opportunity to sell that again in the future if you want to or whatever. But the reason that you buy it is because it makes you feel good to have it. So um, that and that there's there's no such thing as a price tag on that, but that you still do have the requirement of, of building that value with your collectors and showing them having a reason for them to pay what they're paying for your work. You don't just get to step up and go 15 million for this picture of my beach ball. Thanks guys. If you are widely respected in the market and you're already viewed as a fine artist and people have begun collecting your art, then you have the ability to go 15 million for my beach ball. So even in that aspect of it. You still have to establish yourself in that community to find the collectors who are going to be willing to invest in you. And that's what photographers are struggling with right now in the NFT space is the collectors are digital art collectors. And what they're looking for is often digital art. And for those of us trying to get in with photography, um, fingers crossed, we are fighting for our place in that market. And it won't be long, I think, before not only photography, but that mix of photography plus digital art is going to start, you know, gaining its its space and making room for itself. But I think the bottom line here, community, is that your pricing, while a million different factors are going to come into play in figuring that out, it ultimately comes down to math. And if you cannot earn what you need to survive, that math will tell you. If the money is not coming in, you're going to know. If you have to earn thirty thousand dollars in order to pay your bills and you can't do it that math is going to tell you. I mean, this isn't a, a, a nebulous thing where charge what you're worth is the answer. There is real math that you can do from putting, you know, adding your cost of doing business to your salary and dividing that by your shoot days. I mean, that's just a super, super broad, obviously, but that'll give you at least a baseline to know what it's going to take in order to, to live as a photographer and then what you have to charge in order to work. So guys, you have been amazing. It's an hour and a half um, longer than what we were supposed to be here. I'm so sorry, but I'd love to get um, your final thoughts, uh, Chris and Kevin, on pricing. If there's anything that you can leave people with regarding pricing their photography, what would it be? I agree with what Kevin just said. <laughs> oh, um... We've said that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think I think the the best piece of advice re really comes down to um, do your research um, and consult with your colleagues. Th th those are the most those two pieces of advice have been what I've followed these past few years and what have really contributed the most to my understanding and knowledge of pricing. And um, just you know i, I want to encourage people to you know even if you're not inherently uh skilled with negotiation and and pricing and understanding numbers like this is something that you can build upon and you don't don't resign yourself to just well i'm not a business person so you know i, I can't I, i'm not going to be good at this you can become good at this you know but you probably weren't always a good photographer or a great photographer but you learn that and you can learn this side of the business too so um, I would say to, uh, you know, be willing to, to research and keep your, your finger on the pulse of what's happening uh, because things are changing quickly. Uh, but there is absolutely an opportunity to thrive in this profession. You just have to know where to look and, uh, and keep going. Well said, sir. And also remember, this, it's a strategy. Uh, you're not going to do stuff that you see direct results of uh, immediately. That's just that's not how this works. You have to try some stuff and implement it and give it some months and see how that goes. And sometimes things will work and sometimes things won't. And sometimes you'll have to tweak. Uh, 
Um, and that's all part of the process, all part of the learning process. And just as we can sit up here and say, these are the things that you need to do, doesn't necessarily mean based on you and your personality and what your business model is and where you live in the world. They're necessarily 100% always going to be foolproof and always work. And you have to figure out ultimately what's gonna what's gonna best work for you in your business. Uh, something that I think as uh, a book that helped me a long, long time ago was uh, it book yourself solid. There's like this workbook with there's a regular book and there's a fun workbook and you just kind of fill in worksheets and stuff. And it's a really good um, it's a really good uh, tool, I think, for figuring out who you are and, and where your work tries to go. It's very scalable and, and who your target demographic is and how you define that, both yourself and how you define your you know, your target customer. Um, and kind of knowing who those are will, will really go a long way. You can't just say, I'll take any work that comes in. Uh, because although you may, that's not necessarily the best strategy for marketing yourself. Yeah, good point. Um, also, yes, I read that book. It is a good one. And the, the workbooks and stuff really will give people a hand. I mean, just to see. Yeah, it, it's a good it, way to simplify it. the process. Yeah, yeah. just to ask yourself. Even, down. It just forces right, you to like write no. down. Sure. And even even just reminding yourself to ask yourself who you want to be in your market. You know, do am I do I want to be McDonald's? Hey, don't frown at that. McDonald's makes a lot of freaking money, you know. So like, don't, don't get your feelings hurt, but that's a very much different. It's just a different model. I'm serving a million people versus I'm charging a whole lot more to serve five people. It's, it's just a different model. So it goes back to, to figuring out what kind of business you want to run. So um, I will just kind of end by saying first, Kevin and Chris, thank you guys so much for showing up today. It was amazing chatting with you. I think people are going to be able to walk away from this and the accompanying article with a lot of fantastic information they didn't have before and hopefully some insights that help them figure out how they can move forward. Um, and maybe even if they want to move forward, because this might be a thing when, you, when you're starting off and you think it would be really great to earn money from your business and then you realize what all that entails and how much... <laughs> How much business? Somewhere, somewhere, gonna someone's going to watch this video and they're going to be like, oh, I quit. I quit. <laughs> I don't want to do this. You're welcome. <laughs> we just saved you from two years of heartache if this is not where you want to be. Um, this sounds like really, it sucks. That's, right? That, but that's an important thing to know as well. I mean, I think uh, it's, it's easy. And, and I'll just say this from a mom perspective, starting as a photographer, people go, you do really good photographs. You want to take pictures for us? And then you're like, yeah. And then you, you're getting validation and then you're making some money and you think this is great. I'll run a business. I could run it from my house and I'll make money. And then you realize business is not what you love at all. And it's a real pain in the butt and it's hard to balance with your kids and everything else. And so then you go, I just spent two years trying to get this business off the ground and I hate it. And I just want to take really nice photos and I don't want to run a business and guess what, folks? That's okay. You don't have to be a business person. You can still be an amazing photographer and not run a photography business. So, so true. I think that's important to know as well. Um, and there's nothing wrong with it. No, God, we got to stop that. I this idea that the only legitimate photographers are the business people because that's not a thing. There's a lot of fantastic business people who make a lot of money from photography and are not fantastic photographers, but they give a great experience and their clients are happy with their images and that's all that matters. So sure. at the end of the day, folks. Um, so guys, please take your time to really do the math first and consider whether or not, first of all, you want to earn an income from photography, because um, as you can see, either obviously both of these fellas are still doing it and they didn't leave. So it is obviously worth the trouble um, but is it worth the trouble for you? So make sure that you do the math and you figure out what you need to earn and you, you put into place some of the things that we talked about today. Um, the NPPA calculator is also a really good thing to look at that will let you see some of the hard costs that you can put in and just give you a good baseline for where you may need to be business-wise in order to earn a living. Um, so that's something that you can look at and we'll include the link to that in the description. So have a look at that um, if you're if you're you know still trying to figure this whole thing out. But Hopefully today was really helpful. Um, I want to encourage everybody like, and subscribe, please. If you want to see more content Ooh, like this, fancy. But also I know, but also please um, share this with people that you think it will help. That's something we can watch something and get a lot from it, 
but there's other people out there who need this information as well. And they're not going to find it if you don't help them along the way. So if you think somebody out there can benefit from this, please share it with them and keep an eye out. We're going to be doing more interviews like this, giving you guys more great information on pro edu YouTube channel. So be here for that stuff. And until the next interview, guys, keep an eye out. And hopefully this was helpful. Chris and Kevin. Thanks guys. Thank you. Bye everybody. Thank you.